As Jaime mentioned, an obvious policy question at the current juncture is whether an inflation flare-up could bring to an end the expansion underway. Indeed, economic slack is vanishing in a number of key advanced economies. And in the post-war era, a monetary policy tightening to contain inflation has been the most common cause of recessions. This question, in turn, begs an even more fundamental one. How much do we really know about the inflation process? After all, since the crisis, policymakers have been repeatedly surprised. During the Great Recession, inflation turned out to be higher than expected given the depth of the slump. During the subsequent upswing, it has overall turned out to be lower than expected. And on balance, post-crisis, inflation has remained stubbornly low despite huge central bank efforts to push it up. <coughs> Moreover, if history is anything to go by, our profession has struggled to understand inflation for quite a long time. As Charles Goodhart has recently reminded us, albeit at the cost of some inevitable oversimplification, since the 1950s we have seen three major fashions wax and wane. From the 50s to the mid 70s, the focus was on labor markets and relative bargaining power with little reference to aggregate demand. From the late 70s to the 90s, it was mainly on money and monetary aggregates. And from the 90s onwards, it has been on the Nairo and the determinants of expectations. Think of new Keynesian Phillips curves. Could it be that we know less than we think? In the spirit of inquiry, I would like to explore these issues further. And I will make three points. First, we may be underestimating the influence that globalization has had on inflation. Second, if so, a flare-up may not be that likely. And third, if the hypothesis is correct, it would also point to some refinements in monetary policy strategies. Let me take each point in turn. Let me start with one observation. The link between domestic measures of slack and inflation has proved rather weak and elusive for at least a couple of decades now. True, if one tries hard enough, it is always possible to find it. But it is not the kind of relationship that ju jumps out at you and appears robust. Indeed, this is a recurrent theme in the discussions that we have at our BIS meetings. This graph is just one possible illustration among many. It plots the coefficient of the response of inflation to a measure of labor market slack, the red line, alongside confidence bands, shaded area, for a panel of G7 countries estimated over a 15-year rolling window. We see that the coefficient has tended to decline and become statistically insignificantly different from zero. In other words, inflation no longer appears sufficiently responsive to tightness in labor markets. Again, let me stress, one can get statistically significant coefficients for some specifications, but the picture portrayed in the graph is quite typical. Moreover, it would have been even starker had one used output-based as opposed to labor market-based measures of slack. The same graph shows that the picture is not fundamentally different for, for wages, which is the blue line. True, as also found in other work, the relationship remains statistically significant. But just as for inflation, it has tended to decline over time. As we know, the surprisingly weak response of wages to economic conditions has been very much in evidence recently in a number of advanced economies. Now, how can we explain these developments? Well, probably the most popular explanation is that greater anti-inflation credibility has weakened the link. Inflation expectations become better anchored around central bank inflation objectives so that wages and prices become less responsive to slack. No doubt there is a lot to be said for this hypothesis. We all know that since at least the early 1980s, central banks have been much more successful in delivering low and stable inflation. And inflation expectations do appear to be quite sticky around targets. Indeed, this graph shows that in 2017, long-term inflation expectations remain remarkably well anchored around central bank objectives. And in fact, exceptions have been quite rare for a long time now. 
At the same time, other hypotheses can provide <coughs> complementary explanations. One that to our mind merits particular attention is that the globalization of product, capital, and labor markets has played a significant role. Is it reasonable to believe that the inflation process should have remained immune to the entry into the global economy of the former Soviet bloc and China, and to the opening up of other emerging market economies? This added something like 1.6 billion people to the effective labor force, drastically shrinking the share of advanced economies. As we see in this graph, that share had fallen by about half by 2015. Surely we should expect both labor and firms to have become more sensitive to global conditions. We know that workers are not competing just with fellow workers in the same country, but also with workers abroad. We know that for a given nominal exchange rate, the prices of two tradable goods that are close substitutes should track each other pretty closely. And we know that exchange rates have not been fully flexible. In other words, one should expect globalization to have made markets much more contestable, eroding the pricing power of both labor and firms. If so, it is quite possible that the wage price spirals of the past have become less likely. More specifically, one can think of two types of effect of globalization on inflation. The first is symmetrical. Assuming something akin to a global Phillips curve, one would expect domestic slack to be an insufficient measure of inflationary or disinflationary pressures. Global slack would matter as well. The second is asymmetrical. One would expect the entry of lower cost producers and of cheaper labor into the global economy to have put persistent downward pressure on inflation in advanced economies, at least until costs converge. Now, what is the empirical evidence for this hypothesis? Many studies have found that the global component of inflation has tended to increase over time. This graph illustrates the point. The left-hand side panel shows that inflation rates have become more correlated across countries. The size of the bars gets bigger. The right-hand side panel shows an increase in the co-movement of domestic and global unit labor costs. The blue line trends up. But, of course, this type of evidence, no matter how sophisticated statistically, does not disentangle the factors that are behind these co-movements. Other forces could be at work, including the widespread adoption of inflation targeting, which is an obvious and good candidate for this. One way of testing the symmetrical version of the hypothesis more directly is to check whether global measures of slack help explain domestic inflation over and above domestic ones. A number of studies, including some done at the BIS, have found some support for this view. That said, the literature remains divided on this issue. In recent research, we have taken this line of inquiry one step further by looking more closely at the possible mechanisms at work. In particular, we have examined the role of global value chains, which have grown substantially since the 1990s. This can be seen in this graph. The ratio of intermediate goods to world GDP, which is a proxy for the size of global value chains, has increased a lot over the period. That is the red line. And clearly, it has increased much more than the corresponding ratio for final goods trade, which is the blue line. Now, surely one should expect global value chains to have been a key transmission channel of global influences on domestic inflation, notably by increasing competition at all stages of production. And this is indeed what we find by considering a sample of 18 countries over more than 20 years. Specifically, we find that global value chains help explain the relative importance of global and domestic measures of slack in driving domestic inflation, both across countries and over time. This is illustrated in the following graph. The left-hand side panel shows a clear correlation between the cross-country incidence of an indicator of global value chains, which is measured on the horizontal axis, and the relative importance of the two slack measures on the vertical axis. On average over the period, the higher the incidence of global value chains in a given country, the greater the relative relevance of the global slack measure for that country. The right-hand side panel shows a similar correlation over time. For any given year, the higher the average incidence of global value chains for all countries, 
they hide the relative relevance of the global slack measure. As you see, the line clearly is upward sloping. So much for the symmetrical effect. The asymmetrical effect of globalization on inflation is probably even harder to test. In particular, since contestability is key, actual measures of trade penetration do not quite do the job because the mere threat of, of a penetration matters more. One way of getting at the problem, at least indirectly, is to see whether the impact of globalization on domestic markets helps to explain changes in domestic Phillips curves. Some evidence to this effect is discussed in this year's annual report. Specifically, we find that indicators of the secular decline in labor's pricing power, as proxied by employment protection, union, dens union density and coverage, help explain the decline in the responsiveness of wages to domestic slack conditions that we saw in the first graph. Now, if, as it stands to reason, globalization has contributed to this decline in pricing power, it should also have reduced the wage responsiveness to slack. Now, of course, the evidence presented so far is just the first step. Moreover, globalization is only one factor that may have contributed to persistent upward pressures on inflation. Surely technological change has also helped reduce the pricing power of both labor and firms, and hence the likelihood of the wage price spirals of the past. But the plausibility of the hypothesis, coupled with the testi testimony of daily observation, suggests that it deserves much more careful scrutiny. If correct, what would the hypothesis imply for the inflation risks at the current juncture? In principle, the effect is ambiguous. On the one hand, the fact that slack is vanishing in many economies simultaneously, as documented in this graph, suggests that focusing exclusively on country-specific developments may underestimate the inflation in the pipeline. On the other hand, the persistent downward pressure of globalization on inflation would work in the opposite direction. On balance, I would suggest that the second effect <coughs> dominates. After all, it is not uncommon for many countries to be in a similar cyclical position. And the current recovery does not seem to be especially synchronized, as the right-hand side panel of the graph shows. As the size of the bars indicates, the recent recovery, in fact, appears less synchronized than the previous one. Moreover, wage pressures remain remarkably low. What about the implications of the hypothesis for monetary policy? Well, let me mention just three and choose them in a spirit of being provocative. First, the popular dictum, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, requires careful interpretation. There is a sense in which it is a truism. Inflation cannot continue for very long unless the central bank accommodates it. And, and the central bank can surely bring inflation down if it wants to. And all this is extremely important, as we know. But the hypothesis does suggest that real factors may also have persistent effects by influencing wage and price setting behavior. Second, we should not overestimate the central bank's ability to fine tune inflation. This follows in part from the previous implication and it is reinforced by the possible possible importance of global as opposed to purely country-specific factors driving inflation. In particular, raising inflation against powerful headwinds may prove harder than previously thought. Indeed, the recent difficulties central banks in many advanced economies have been facing could be interpreted in this way. The, the globalization tailwinds that helped central banks bring inflation under control pre-crisis became headwinds when central banks tried to push it up post-crisis. Third, this puts a premium on understanding the factors driving inflation. To the extent that disinflationary pressures result from forces such as globalization or indeed technology, they should be generally benign. They would reflect favorable supply side developments as opposed to damaging demand weakness. At a minimum, this suggests lengthening the horizon over which it would be desirable to bring inflation back towards target. Let me conclude with a more speculative reflection about the future. 
From a historical perspective, struggling to push inflation up towards target is a highly unusual challenge. The traditional one has been struggling to bring it down or indeed to keep it from rising. But if the hypothesis is correct, one could envisage a future in which the old challenge could return. If globalization were to be rolled back at some point, it is quite possible that central banks would find themselves struggling again to bring inflation down. A much more indebted world would provide a powerful incentive for governments to inflate the debt away. And a retreat into financial and trade protectionism would provide the right environment to do so. But if this was the solution to persistently low inflation, it would clearly be much worse than the problem. Thank you. <laughs>